Coming up next in This Week in Computer Hardware, Seagate says hard drives will be scarce for a year. When is Ivy Bridge coming? GTX 560 Ti 448 cores. You're going to love this one. Four terabyte hard drives, USB 3.0 issues, 3A SLI, and why the Windows Experience Index ain't our benchmark of choice. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week Computer Hardware, episode 147, recorded December 1st, 2011. Screw hard drives, go SSD. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Newegg Gadget Trade Insight, powered by Gazelle. Trade in your used gadgets today at newegg.com slash trade and receive a Newegg gift card. That's newegg.com slash trade. And by Ford, featuring available sync with My Ford Touch. Sync with My Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed on screen. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. Welcome to Twitch this week in computer hardware. My name is Patrick Norton, joined as always by the man, the benchmarking legend, Mr. Ryan Shroud, who is happily home. Dude, how's Kentucky? Is it cold yet? It is cold. It was uh, about 40 degrees out when I just came in from uh, eating dinner. Uh, <laughs> we did have our first, we had, we had some snow a couple of days ago, not... Um, really substantial snow but it was it was snowing and i was shaking my fist at the sky even though eventually i kind of <laughs> like the snow once i get accustomed to the cold i actually kind of like snow less people drive when it snows out and i have all <laughs> four-wheel drive, four drive cars so i can kind of you know get the road to my own type of thing that's a big plus. IndieLinks, of course, uh, purchased by OCZ uh, not too long ago and they've released the first IndieLinks based OCZ drives made after the purchase or the first new generation of OCC drives made with the IndieLynx controllers. Something that I think a lot of people are confused about, is, is IndieLynx still selling to people other than OCC or are IndieLynx controllers all going to, does, does OCC can has all IndieLynx controllers at this point? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, that's still up in the air. We were kind of talking about that last night uh, with Alan, mm -hmm. who's our storage guy who actually wrote this review. Um, the, the previous IndieLynx controllers. I, I imagine those are still being sold to other partners that may still want them. There's probably not a whole lot of them. Uh, the, it was the bare, Barefoot was the name of the controller, right? And it's, it's kind of outdated now. Maybe you'll find some really, really budget-based ones on there. And I, and I imagine OCZ was honoring any and all contracts they had uh, that any links would have had with other system or uh, drive builders at the time. However, with, sorry, with Everest, which is the new controller, mm -hmm. none of those contracts would have existed. So, as of this moment, it is an OCZ exclusive. Alan seems to take the opinion that we will see this controller on other partners' products, other um, drive builders' products. And OCZ will take it as a, as a way to make money in two different ways. Maybe they will sell uh, their Octane drive, which is the new SSD, based on the Everest controller with a little bit of custom firmware, a little bit of extra performance maybe that they can figure out with it. Uh, and then only sell reference designs to other companies like maybe SanDisk or Patriot or whoever it is, right, that want to do that. I tend to take the right. opinion that if, you know, if you're OCZ and you actually have a competitive IP, it's competitive with Sanford, it's competitive with Intel, and mm -hmm. you have basically bet your entire company on solid-state <laughs> drives, right, it, they are out of everything else, um, this is really... I, I think it would be more intelligent for them to keep that product in-house. Not as good for consumers, right? We want more competition. Right. Um, but I think from their standpoint, it makes more sense to keep the, this controller internal. And, and, and it's, it turns out to be like a really good controller. So they're, they're offering, there'll be 128, 256, 512 gig drives available. And then one terabyte drives, there'll be a one terabyte SSD in a two and a half inch drive form factor which I believe that would be the, the first for that as well. Uh, it's SATA 6. We're talking about read speeds up to 535 megabytes and write speeds up to uh, 400 megabytes per second. 
on the 512 and one terabyte drives and then 270 mm -hmm. megabytes per second on like the 256 gig. So nice. you get a little bit of variable write speed based on the number of um, channels that are enabled on the controller. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a really competitive chip. It does, does, did very well in our testing, our benchmarking in terms of the sequential reads and writes. It did great on IOPS, uh, so in, in transactions per second, essentially. The only thing it was kind of a little bit behind on were a couple of very specific tests, uh, file copy tests on the same partition. Uh, this <laughs> controller doesn't support compressible data kind of like uh, the Sandforce controllers do where it can compress it. And it maybe you might even think of it as being kind of artificially high. Um, but yeah, so if you look at the file copy test, you can see there the Octane, the one at the top, falls behind Vertex 3, Agility 3, uh, behind Intel's uh, 510 really as well. Not very much so. But, you know, that's, that's kind of one of the places where it falls behind. But what I think is the killer, potential killer feature for this drive is that it is very, very competitively priced. Um, the, let's see, the 256 gig model, I believe, is kind of the sweet spot here with a price per gig of $1.44. Now, Ooh. we've seen specials that bring right. other drives less than that, but for a starting MSRP, that's actually pretty good, right? So you can get a 256 gig drive for 370 bucks. That's, that's, I think, pretty compelling. That's extremely compelling. It's kind of funny that the per gigabyte cost on the 256 gigabyte drive is is less than the 128. I think it's this makes me wonder where, a how long it's going to be uh, before one terabyte SSD drives are common. Sorry, I was like sitting there looking at the uh, uh, at the graphic uh, up on the 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 Skype monitor. The uh, it, I think it'll be really interesting to see how long it takes 512 uh, uh, gigabyte drives to drop in price. It, it's just. You know, we're going to talk about hard drive uh, availability in a second. Because if you try to, have you, if you have tried to buy a one terabyte, two terabyte, three terabyte drive in the past couple of weeks, uh, you have probably been emotionally scarred. Um, and it plans, it, it promises to get even worse as we get closer to Christmas. But the uh, man, I just see a huge opportunity for SSDs this year. Uh, but they really need to get kind of over the hump and get as close to one terabyte and drop the price as much as possible. Um, but that's a really nice starting price. It also makes me realize how long it's been since, you know, like remember when a dollar a gigabyte was a big deal <laughs> on rotating media? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, I mean, we're, we're, getting, we're getting down there, right? So it's, this transition is happening. Right. Most people will continue to tell you that it, it will never completely happen. And I, I tend to agree with that, um, you know, with, with things like four terabyte hard drives eventually going to be released once all right. this other stuff in the hard drive world kind of gets fixed. Um, but this, we, you know, the prices need to come down. And also we need to see, you know, we've got a couple of emails. I, I think we've got one or two emails uh, that have come in that have been like, hey, really liked the Octane review, but what do we know about reliability of these drives? And it's one of the things is mm -hmm. there's in a limited time that we're able to spend with the new product, if, we've, if we only have it for three days or a week or whatever, there's no way for us to test long-term viability of the platform, uh, of the drive, of the controller, of the memory configuration with that. It's one of those things that we continually leave stuff on the test bench and we, we use it in real-world systems and we see, kind of see what happens. But even then, we only have one drive. Even if they send us five drives or they send us 10 drives, it's nothing compared to the tens right. and 20,000 that will be able to exist in the next couple of weeks. So uh, it, it will all come down to kind of reading the reports of a lot of other consumers. So there you have it. I thought this was an interesting story. Um, I, this is one of my favorite lines of all time. Um, when we first heard rumors about this product back in October, I posited that the company would be crazy to simply call this the GeForce GTX 560 Ti Special Edition. Well, I guess this makes me the jackass. The new $290 GPU from NVIDIA <laughs> will be officially called the GeForce GTX 560 Ti with 448 cores, which officially proves that GPU companies are the worst namers of products, or, or, or in this case, perhaps the most specific namers of products in history, except <laughs> you get to the next paragraph in the PC Per article. The GeForce GTX 560 Ti with 448 cores is actually not a GTX 560 Ti at all. Um, but <laughs> as somebody who's about to update their GPU so they can start playing video games that look pretty with their friends again, this is a really compelling card for $300. 
Um, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm quite ready to spend $300 on a GPU, but this is a really, really interesting concept. Why did NVIDIA decide suddenly, though, to release a special edition version of a, of a not 560 GTX? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting. The, the, these two cards, we had an MSI card and an EVGA card in, and uh -huh. the 560 Ti 448 is actually the same physical die and GPU that the 580 and 570 are built on, right? So that, that, that GPU is called GF110. It's a uh, 40 nanometer part. You know, the, the 580 is the full GPU, and then the 570 is the full GPU minus one cluster of processors disabled, called an SM, a simultaneous multiprocessor. Got it. So what has happened, is, and, and, and then the, the 560 Ti that exists today, that was previously existed, is a completely different chip. Uh, called GF114. It has 384 shader processors, and that's the mm -hmm. most processors that exist on that particular chip. So what, what happened was, is NVIDIA, when they're building 580s and 570s, sometimes they uh, will get a chip that can't quite run at 580, and it can't quite run at 570 in terms of a <laughs> number of processors that can be enabled at one time uh, right. or run at that correct frequency. So since the introduction of the 580, apparently, they had had this collection of GF110 chips that could run with 448 cores, but they didn't have a product for it, right? They had, in my estimate, this is all only my estimate, not NVIDIA's, they won't tell you any specific numbers, about 10,000 of these GPUs sitting in a warehouse. And they finally said, okay, let's just sell these as, as something, right? Let's get them out of here, make some money off of it, you know, do something for the holiday and when, when PC gaming is big again with... Battlefield of Batman and Skyrim and all those types of things out and, and people are excited about gaming again. And that results in these two cards. So these are 448 core GF100 mm -hmm. GPUs. Um, they perform about 15 to 20% better than the GTX 560, the standard one, and about five, only about 5% less than the 570. Um, mm -hmm. And we got MSI, EVGA. The MSI one has a really, really, really nice cooler in it. It actually runs under load at about 57C. Which is, which is really, really, really impressive. Um, right. And it's physically a much heavier car than this EVGA model. This EVGA model uh, runs pretty cool as well. Both of these are the $299 options. You know, you get your standard type of uh, NVIDIA connections to dual link DVI and the mini HDMI and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. EVGA one has eight pin and six pin power. The MSI one actually has two six pin power connections, um, but otherwise they're, they're, they're pretty much the same. So what's interesting about this performance, like I said, much closer to the 570 than the 560 Ti. So their price is much closer. So the, the, the 570 was about 530 bucks. So you get this for about $30 less and about you know, 5%. Actually, this EVGA model is overclocked. Um, the base is 732. This one runs at 797 megahertz, and it's faster than a base 570. So hmm. while they exist, these are, these are great cards. Um, AMD's, excuse me, AMD still has viable option with the 6950 two gigabyte card. It's like uh -huh. 260 bucks or something like that. So there, there's still some competition there. It's not a, a runaway win. Right. Uh, but the, but this, this is a great NVIDIA card for people that uh, wanted a little bit more power than that existed before. You know, NVIDIA didn't have a card in this price range. They had a $230 card and then they had a $330 card. Right. And there was nothing in that $100 gap, which is a pretty big gap not to have a SKU, considering how many they have under $230. Do you think this is going to street closer to $250, $270, or do you think it's going to stay pretty close to $300? Because as somebody who has, has been circling a GTX 560 for the past couple weeks, yeah. um, you know, do, you think it's, do you think it's justifying the extra? Basically, it's, it's awfully close to 100 bucks over the, uh, you know, it's like 70. I think it's going to be selling for 60 or 70 bucks more than a GTX 560. I, I think it, if you look at it in terms of performance per dollar, it makes a very mm -hmm. compelling case for itself over the 560 Ti, um, a base one. So, like, you can buy 560 Ti's that are very, very, like, uh, the 384 core model that are very highly mm -hmm. overclocked, but you're, you're going to pay 260, 270 for those, right? So, at 230, I'm talking about the base kind of reference designs, the cheapest you can find one of those cards at. I think this is going to be a great card, um, for anybody that can buy them. They, NVIDIA says they expect these to only be around for six to eight weeks. And that's kind of why they didn't, we talked about the naming scheme at the beginning. Right. They didn't want to assign 
GTX 565 to it. Apparently because they thought that would, <laughs> you know, by creating a new SKU and a new name for it, that they would have to continually answer questions about what happened with the 565. Why is that one? Why did you guys kill that one off? Um, you know, they, they really wanted to make it apparent that this was a limited edition thing. It wasn't going to be around forever. They expect six to eight weeks of availability, but obviously that all depends on how many uh, people actually buy them. But, you know, I, I, I think it's a really good card. If I were building a new gaming system, this would be a, a very viable option. I would maybe look at one of the $289 versions that's mm -hmm. uh, going to be overclockable to, you know, well above whatever the $299 versions cost. Um, and I do, as I kind of point out in the review, if you are interested in doing SLI with these, you need to buy two now because <laughs> do not wait, wait two months. This will be like the one time where I can almost assuredly say, if you wait two months, that's it's going to be too long. They're going to be gone. It was, so. It's funny. I looked up at the, uh, you know, you look at the list. You, you pointed out in the article, but if you take a look at, and I'm putting the link up here, so chat and grab it. If you take a look at uh, Newegg.com, um, literally EVGA is selling these for 289 299 and then Zotac and MSI are 310 Gigabytes, 315 yeah, um, and Asus is rocking the $330 price um, for this chipset. <laughs> the EVGA is actually the most cost efficient like the like right. and that, and that 299 classified card is a great mm -hmm. card um i don't yeah i mean i i don't know how you know and it's running at a higher clock speed than the zotac ones below it and the msi and the gigabyte and all that kind of stuff i don't know how they can you know some people just want to while they're popular get the higher price out of it EVJ obviously decided not to do that this time so good on them it's funny. I, I, I got to check Amazon really quickly just to see whether or not that's available now. Um, cause you know, I like not paying sales tax cause I'm cheap. Um, this is a happy story or that I think the G4 TI is a happy story. Uh, Seagate, uh, with kind of a bummer announcement to say the least. Um, <laughs> Title says it all. Seagate says hard drive industry will take a year to recover. And this is a, I mean, we, we've been getting hammered with this question on Texil. I'm sure you guys have been hammered with it on PCPer.com. When are hard drive prices going to go down? Um, you know, last month we noticed, um, says Ryan Shroud, that hard drive prices were spiking very high. Uh, and it's all about the devastating flooding in Thailand. Um, Thailand got stomped. An incredible percentage of the world hard drive production comes out of Thailand. Um, you know, the original story, you note, uh, quotes the CEO of Western Digital saying it could take multiple quarters for recovery. Uh, Seagate CEO said on Bloomberg, uh, the, the fabulous business site um, run by the not-so-fabulous mayor of New York City, quote, the projections by some Wall Street analysts of production will be back to pre-flood levels by summer are nonsense. This is going to take a lot longer than people are assuming until the end of 2012 at least, and by then, demand will have gone up. And I think, Ryan, you pretty much said it all when you said, well, crap. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's, that's not what we wanted to hear. Um, yeah. There's still some hope. There's still some hope that this guy's just kind of wrong. Uh, it, it, usually executives, when they make kind of bold statements like this, tend to not be wrong. They, well, yeah. You know, they have it, a lot well, of weight behind say, their statements. There's, you know, it's interesting because he's, he's saying this to Bloomberg, which means he's specifically addressing Wall Street. And CEOs, when they're addressing Wall Street, want to make themselves look like A, heroes, and be responsible for their company looking good. Uh, but mostly they say stuff to Wall Street because they're trying to keep their stock price from being punished by Wall Street. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure he's, he's partially saying like, hey, Wall Street, you know, our primary source of hard drives got stomped. The primary source of the most important parts and hard drives got stomped. We have to rebuild the infrastructure for the, the channel that delivers our hard drives. Um, it's going to take a long time. Don't punish us because it's going to take a long time. Um, you know, so that said, he could be he could be making it sound much worse than it is so that everything looks really awesome earlier in the year uh, to help the stock price. But he also may be really legitimate. This is, I mean, this is going to be interesting. See, this is going to impact... You know, system prices, notebook prices, server prices. You know, I mean, what does you know Google buy like four million hard drives every two weeks or something like that? I'm yeah. exaggerating for for you know fun, but um, this is a big deal. 
And it's going to be really interesting to see, A, how long it takes uh, Thailand to recover, and B, how long it takes for Western Digital and Seagate and, and, and the other two companies that are left making rotating media um, right. to sort of, you know, better distribute their manufacturing facilities around the world. But this sucks. Um, short, short and long of it is pretty much that the hard drive situation sucks and will continue to suck. And if you were planning on storing terabytes of media, it's going to hurt because you're looking at two terabyte drives right now selling for 160, 190, 200 bucks, depending on where you're going. When I was buying three terabyte drives on sale for 85 to 125, you know, two months ago and at regular price, 125 to 150. Yeah, <laughs> that's painful. So that's a notebook hard drive yeah. uh, that's selling for 240 bucks for 750 gigabytes. That probably would have been selling for, you know, $100, $125. How big was that hard drive? Uh, that was 750 that gigabytes. Okay, that, that was the new. That was, yeah, that was a 750 gig. That was the new hybrid one. Um, so it's hybrid it's, solid um, state. I mean, 200. So. Yeah, be gentle with your hard drives. You might want to think about backing up the important stuff online. <laughs> Indeed, because <laughs> it's um, availability so hard, is going to be difficult. Hard, hard drive prices suck. You know what does not suck? Getting money. <laughs> for your extra stuff that you have laying around. That's right. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Newegg.com, the place on the internet to shop for tech. So here's what's interesting. Now you can trade in your used gadgets and get a Newegg gift card at the Newegg, Newegg trade-in site powered by Gazelle. I think we've probably all heard of Gazelle. If you haven't heard of Newegg, they are a leading online retailer. We talk about them all the time here on Twitch. Um, they are one of the best sites. They're just mo one of the most reliable. They're the first to get stock. Uh, everybody, if you're a hardware company, you're trying to sell your stuff through Newegg. Um, they, they pride themselves on the shopping experience, rapid delivery, customer service. They have over 84,000 products. I, that kind of boggled my mind. An award-winning website. They equip their customers with information to help them make decisions, uh, such as they have really detailed specs. They have how-tos, 1.9 million plus and growing customer reviews, which uh, those are always very helpful, and high-res photo galleries. Newegg also has a trade-in site now powered by Gazelle. It's at newegg.com slash trade. It gives you a fast and easy way to get a Newegg gift card for the value of, her, of your used gadgets. Your smartphones, MP3 players, laptops, digital cameras, GPS devices, e-readers, video games, all of that stuff. Gadgets in 20 product categories with over 200,000 unique items. So uh, how much Newegg gift card will you actually get for your gadgets? Obviously, obviously, it depends on what the gadget is, what the quality is, that kind of stuff. Um, but they're, selling, they're taking iPhones in for between $122 and $163. iPod Touch 4Gs for $107. Uh, HTC Sensation 4Gs going for $195. And the Motorola Droid Bionic, which is a nice phone, is going for $290. bucks. e reader um, Kindle 3G or the Kindle 3 3G plus Wi-Fi is going for 43 bucks. Uh, considering I think that's like the $79 model, maybe the $89 model. That's pretty good. And digital cameras going from anywhere from 82 bucks to $171. I actually had a Canon uh, 230 HS camera that we um, uh, bought didn't really need, meet our needs in terms of the high speed functionality. We were looking for something to record 120 frames per second. Well past the return policy. Couldn't do anything with it, but we could trade it into the Gazelle uh, through newegg.com slash trade and get, I think we got $110 or something else nice. uh, for that. It's not a sale. It's not, um, you're not, you know, putting it up for an auction. The value that they tell you is what you're going to get once you send in all your parts and they verify that it's in the quality that it needs to be in. So, Here's the offer. Round up all your used gadgets from your home and your office. Go to newegg.com slash trade to see what your gadgets are worth today. Newegg will give you a gift card for the cash value of your electronics. The sooner you trade, the better the price. So uh, go to newegg.com slash trade and check it out. And as Newegg says, take it from a geek. Newegg.com <laughs> slash trade. And we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. We've wow. been long time. Man. So. No, I'm just like you know, unlike another website I just mentioned, they are not out of the fabulous classified version of the EVGA 448 You can core. trade in some gadgets towards. Oh. That's, that's what you can do, Patrick. You can trade in some of your gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> 
Walker 560 Ti 448 card. <laughs> this makes me very, very happy. <laughs> the, the video games, they will look beautiful again. Speaking of beautiful, if you're still depressed in that CB, the uh, Seagate story, we got something that's a little more cheerful for you. Via uh, has basically been tooting their horn about 10 years of mini ITX, uh, talking about the really cool projects that have been built around the motherboard format. If you're not familiar with mini ITX, it's like Mitro ATX, except smaller. Uh, Micro is 9 inch square, um, mini ITX is 6.7 inches square, and they put together a basically an ebook, the via mini dash ITX ebook.com, and it gives you, gives you a sneak preview of the website. And as you scroll down there, you can see some really crazy stuff. The accordion ITX, I don't know if you can, uh, if you mouse over up a little higher and just start scrolling down it should start there you go peek inside ah there it is the fabulous it, it's it's really one of the most <laughs> unhinged designs ever um <laughs> the bbc itx um using an old bbc model b computer and as you scroll down the vespa pewter uh which i think is highly nice. amazing it's slightly evil and uh, i think it's super fun um and uh, it's a really, if you've never played around with, with a motherboard in that format, it really opens. I mean, you're not going to build a gaming, a massive gaming PC uh, out of a mini ITX board. But if you want to build a server that takes up no space and uh, sits quietly and does its thing, uh, mini ITX is a lot of fun for that. Um, Cyber it's a 155 gamer. page ebook. I'm sorry. Oh, no, go it's ahead. It's just tons of examples of that stuff. It's it's a 155-page ebook, and I'm just just kind of paging through it. There's just tons of, if you're interested in case modding even, even if you're not particularly interested in mini ITX, check it yeah. out. There's just like, there's, it's tons of great examples, so. Yeah, no, they've, they've made it, Via's been really cool about supporting people trying to do cool stuff built around that motherboard format. Um, yeah, I, I like small computers. They make me happy. CyberPower Gamer Ultra 2098 system, one of the latest reviews up at PCPro.com. Uh, it always interests me when you guys decide to review a system somebody else built. I always wondered, you know, do you, Ryan, do you feel that you're harder on the reviews when it's a completed system than you are on individual parts? Or, or is there a level yes. hand? <laughs> well, we're definitely harder on them because we come from the mindset of we're used to building them ourselves. So what extra are you providing somebody? What, right. what are you providing that somebody who's going to build a system themselves might not get? This was an interesting review because CyberPower, they make everything from the super high end, you know, quad SLI gaming systems down to these really low cost machines. And despite the name Gamer Ultra 2098, which I could probably live without. <laughs> This, this is, they, they wanted to send us one that was like extremely budget based. Mm -hmm. So this is a, I think it, 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 when we published this review, it was selling for $599 on Newegg. And it's a quad core bulldozer processor, a somewhat older mini ITX, or not mini ITX, I'm sorry, micro ATX motherboard. So it only has a single PCI Express by 16 slot, but it had eight gigs of memory, had nice. a discrete Radeon HD 6770 graphics card, not a super high end card, but at better than anything integrated, obviously. 500 gig hard drive, you know, DVD burner, 500 watt power supply, and Windows 7 and all that kind of stuff. What made this more interesting to us is that you could buy these exact same components on Newegg and it was gonna cost you $596. So huh. you're only paying like a $3 premium for this all put together with a, you know, a basic warranty and support program behind it, right? And so there's a lot of, I think there's value there to that. And then what's even more impressive to me is like over, I don't know what the price is of it now. I think somebody said it was actually um, deactivated on the Newegg site. So we'll have to see if they ever come back in. But over the holiday weekend, these mm -hmm. were selling for $469. Wow. So you look at it, now you're talking about a hundred something dollars less than the value of all the parts. Now that's something <laughs> worth getting, even if you want to you know, we, we've had, I had several people in our YouTube comments and in our comments on the story say, you know what, I picked one of these up. It's not the best gaming machine, but I can play Skyrim at 1080p and medium settings or high settings, whatever it is. And, you know, in, in four months, I'll replace the graphics card and right. the power supply, right? And, and it kind of gives you this little base. And you can replace the quad core bulldozer with the eight core bulldozer if you want down the line. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to take a look at a low cost pre-built machine and what advantages and disadvantages it would offer. And it's pretty cool also because most of the time 
vendors are really adamant. They, the last thing they want to do is send out an affordable system. They want to send out something that is full zoot, over the top, yes. completely outfitted, that's going to bust the benchmarks, you know, and, and make them look like they built the super machine. And it's like, you're like, yeah, it's the fastest machine ever. But, you know, it costs, a, a, you know, a mortgage payment. Or if you live somewhere outside of California, two or three mortgage payments. And to have them do something affordable, that's, I, 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 you know, bravo to, to bravo, <laughs> you know, because yeah. all too often people won't touch that. So Agreed. it's been interesting. Arkham City, uh, Batman Arkham City, hugely popular, something I know you guys have been playing constantly at PCPro.com. Um, Quote, it appears the developers have had some issues with the release DX11 features are causing significant stuttering even with high-end hardware. Is this a DX11 issue, i.e. a Microsoft issue, or is this a driver issue, or does anybody even know at this point? According, according to everything that I've been able to learn, it is a uh -huh. developer issue. Ooh. Apparently, previous builds of the game did not exhibit this behavior on, on hardware. Uh, and then once the retail game came out, there were all these issues. Uh, so it's probably, they haven't fixed it yet. So it's probably going to be a combination of a game patch, and maybe a driver patch. I think AMD has released two new drivers trying to fix the X11 performance on it. And mm -hmm. you can see when you watch the video, it turns into a slideshow at some times on, on, with the X11 features enabled. And we're not even talking about, let's be honest, we're not talking about really, really high end DX11 features. Tessellation, ambient occlusion, and soft right. shadows, those types of things. Um, this this shouldn't be causing this type of problem. This was on a, our video was recorded off a GTX 580 graphics card, so the fastest oh. single GPU you can get, um, and it was it went from like 160 frames per second with DX11 turned off to like 45 frames per second with DX11 turned on. But the issue is minimum frame rates at zero, right? So you're getting these a lot of right. s solid stutters on it. So uh, <laughs> if you're playing, stutters. the part that's most aggravating is that. Mm -hmm. Arkham City was delayed on the PC by four to six weeks or something like that versus when it came out on the consoles. And one of the reasons for it was, ah, we're going to make sure DX11 is in there. It's going to look better than it does on the, on the consoles. Plus, you're going to have NVIDIA PhysX support and blah, blah, blah. And then it comes out and you get all this crap broken. Right. And this, it, 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 it really kind of hurts the PC gamer inside of me, right? That it's like, uh, we waited for all this and then it doesn't even work and it still doesn't work. And there's, and the, the solution that they posted on the forums is, hey, um, a workaround for this issue is to run the game with DX9 instead of DX11. Instructions on how to turn off DX11 are listed below. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess it's important to post up there so people can actually play the game. But if you had eight extra weeks and two years of development time on the title, probably should have gotten it right the first time. <laughs> That's, that's just, is, it, is it too much to ask? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We didn't really anticipate many users actually employing DirectX 11 compatible graphics cards. Um, mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, also, it's, it's also amazing. Just Q&A is really frustrating. Uh, yep. And a lack of Q&A is even more frustrating. And even more frustrating than that, if uh, you've been sitting on your hands counting pennies, gathering pennies uh, in anticipation of getting Ivy Bridge in Q1 2012, you can be happy that you have more time to gather pennies because Ivy Bridge is delayed until at least Q2 2012. Um, well, okay, so the early, the Core i7 Ivy Bridge processor might be available in Q2, but it actually is looking more like Q3 for major availability on Ivy Bridge. And, and I'm kind of curious, is this a process issue or is this a, you know, we're still selling a lot of, of, of you know, less we're still selling sandy bridge hand over fist why should we move and we're kicking the snot out of that's probably not a polite thing to say we we have significant performance advantage in many categories <laughs> over amd uh why don't we just wait a little longer before we release the cpu i just thought it was kind of interesting that that ivy ridge because you don't really you know Maybe it's it's the halo effect, but at this point, you don't really think of, of Intel as missing a lot of ship dates, even though they, they do miss one or two here and there. You know, uh, I'm not sure what the reasoning is. It's, you know, the, these roadmaps kind of leaked out, which indicate right. that there's a delay. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is something we had kind of, kind of almost expected, um, being is that I don't have review samples yet. And uh, Sandy right. Bridge was released at CES. 
we had review samples almost the entire month of December. Nobody's even been talking about that to us. Uh, so it doesn't come as a surprise to me, but to the market as a whole, I think it could be process technology. I tend to side more with your second point is that why do we need to release Ivy Bridge? We've got all these Sandy Bridge parts that we've made already. Why do we want to suddenly sell them for less money at discounted prices when we don't really have to? Um, and this, this, ladies and gentlemen, is why AMD needs to figure this stuff out, right? Because comp if AMD's bulldozer part had been competitive, it had pushed Sandy Bridge, you know, if, if Trinity had been released already, which is the, you know, the integrated graphics part, uh, after Lano from AMD, Ivy Bridge, Ivy Bridge would be much more important. Ivy Bridge would be a focus of Intel to get their processor out there to make sure they're ahead of the game. And when you do not have two strong competitors in the market, this is what you get, is delays that they're not going to tell you they're delays. They're going to say, ah, we put flexibility in the roadmap on purpose. We were planning for these types of things. But, but the fact of the matter is that they didn't need to do this so they're not going to struggle, right? So if, they're, if they are having process technology issues, they're not going to drive ahead with it anyway and lose, you know, and, and, and lower their, their profit margin on those parts, you know, with lower yields just because they need to get that part out in the market. They have the, right. they have the capability now to just kind of sit back and be like, eh, we'll wait till everything is really perfect. Uh, our Sandy Bridge stock is low and we can push Ivy Bridge out there. It will still be the best CPU. It will still be competitive on the graphics side of things and you know they're they're golden so i'd like to introduce my beloved ceo mr jim Ladderback, joining me from the Hello. revision 3 boardroom <laughs> jim this is brian <laughs> Shroud from pcper.com how are you sir and the entire Good. this week this. computer hardware audience i'm leaning over i'm gonna lean over a little bit are you listing here we can I'm fix listing. that yes i'm listing <laughs> <laughs> oh darn i was right side up now, I, now I'm dizzy. All As right. we dutch the camera. Bye. <laughs> Patrick, don't you have places to go and people to be with? I always do. That's because I have a family just like you, Jim. Anyways, he's got to stay on so I can watch this. I just want you to know. Nice. I'm stealing his headphones. Dude. Bye. You can't leave. You're on, you're on podcast. I know where you're going to be soon, yeah. and I know where you live. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Oh, my God. See, goodness. I don't have any room behind me for anybody to sneak up and, and magically make... Their way. I've got the little, I got the little whoop monkey up here, but he's only, You'd like he's like a guest now. Um, let's go ahead and mention one quick thing before we get into our emails, I guess. Uh, I wanted to point everybody out. I didn't want to constrict it to the PC perspective audience. Instead, the Twitch audience as well. If you go to PCPer.com and scroll down the news and look for a news story called Gear Up with MSI, we're giving away a couple of prize packages for MSI. This is just, all you got to do is kind of comment on this like us on Facebook, like MSI on Facebook. It's one of those simple, just participatory contests. How about a GTX 580 Lightning card, which is like a, a, a almost $600, $550 video card, and an X79 motherboard getting you ready for Sandy Bridge E uh, build is really nice. That's the first prize. Second prize, you still get a 560 Ti overclocked card and a seven, uh, or I'm sorry, a Z68 motherboard to build a Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge platform out of. Uh, so these are just completely free prizes that you guys can go over to the website and get a hold of and sign up for. Woohoo! Call it, call it a PSA, if you will. Yay. We should take a moment to thank our friends over at Ford for sponsoring this week in computer hardware. Absolutely. This episode Sorry. of this show is brought to you by Ford featuring Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync is the in-car communications, entertainment, and connectivity system that's voice activated to help you keep your hands in the wheel in your eyes on the road. Always important for driving safety. One of the great features with Sync is the Sync Services. Sync Services gives you audible turn-by-turn -turn directions to where you want to go. That's good. I would not like turn-by-turn -turn directions to where I don't want to go. Uh, it also displays directional arrows on screen, all without having to purchase an aftermarket or integrated navigation system. Sync Services includes business search of over 40 million businesses, including telephone numbers, business information, and a business information and of course directions it does have something called send to sync which enables you to use google maps or MapQuest on your home or office computer to plan a trip and then save it online to your sync traffic directions and information systems account right so this is your online account that you have when you sign up with the ford sync setup um, and then use voice commands in your vehicle to get turn-by-turn -turn directions based on that trip that you planned 
on your computer. That to me is like the coolest part. You know, even, even with integrated GPS systems, the interface is awful. Using Google Maps, planning a couple of stops, setting it up all that way, and then being able to basically integrate that automatically with your car is pretty impressive. Uh, a free Sync Des Destinations app available in uh, Android and iTunes app stores gives you mobile access to manage your Sync traffic directions and information systems account on the go. The ability to pre-save destinations to your account, such as home or office, that way you can just voice command navigate to home, navigate to office. Uh, plus, you get traffic updates sent to your mobile phone via a text message, which, of course, the Ford Sync technology can read to you. It's all designed to help you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Ford Sync with My Ford Touch is available on the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. There it is right there. Ford.com slash technology. And we thank Ford for their support of our show. Not only our show, but the entire Twit Network. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Ford. Um, Time for the viewer questions. We're going to start out with a, another hard drive related one. Philip uh, says, my computer is filling up with all of my media I'm adding to it. So I've been searching on the prospect of four terabyte drives and read that Seagate is supposed to start selling one this month. They did. Is this still supposed to be the case as far as you know, or is the prospect of four terabyte internal drives in 2011 wishful thinking? Actually, it is. Love the show. Keep up the good work, Philip. Um, yeah, four terabyte uh, external drives have been floating around. Uh, first, they started announcement back in September. They are available. They're getting reviewed. Um, Newegg.com has them for $280 for the Seagate GoFlex, which is the system from Seagate where you can snap off and snap on different interfaces. So you can do USB 3.0, ESAT, or whatever makes you happy. Um, 280 bucks for that. No signs of an internal four terabyte drive. And this has kind of been, it's, it's, it seems to have been the way of uh, the larger capacities as they show up in the external drives first and they start showing up in internal. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is a single disc four terabyte product, not because, uh, you know, a, a few sure years ago. Like yeah, because a few years ago, you know, the Western Digital Go books and some of the other ones, they were doing like two terabyte drives. And everybody went, oh, two terabyte drives. And then you went to pick it up and it was like four inches thick because it had two one terabyte drives in a single enclosure. So um, there you have it. <laughs> Obviously, the added density drives will filter down into other form factors, including bare drives and RAID arrays in the coming weeks and months. Sure. So... Um, you know, it, you could try buying the four terabyte external drive, gutting it and putting it inside your system. But uh, I have had difficulties with that at least once in the past uh, because of some interesting things about the way the drive inside the enclosure was configured. Um, so I would politely suggest you let someone else <laughs> perform that experiment before you do. Um, but yeah, four terabyte internal drives. I would be shocked to see them showing up uh, before the end of the year. Uh, uh, I've been wrong about this before, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying they're not going to show up. Yeah. Um, you know, and they started kind of announcing four terabyte capacities right around the time Thailand got stomped. So I would imagine availability on this is going to be uh, spotty for a while. And I think it's yep. going to be one of those things that shows up, sells out, shows up, sells out, shows up, sells out. Um, I could be wrong, but they are pretty consistent. 260, 280, the prices are all, uh, all uh, right around there. Three terabyte drives, 200 bucks for an external drive. Um, probably, I think they were selling 260 uh, for an internal drive. So it is exciting times in hard drive enclosures. And then Jim <laughs> has some issues yes. with USB 3.0 accessories, uh, specifically from Black Magic, who is, if you're not familiar with that name, they do some pretty interesting, um, you know, I, I, a few years ago, I'd call it disruptive technology, but they are pushing devices to connect video standards or high-end video standards to uh, PCs and Macs. Yep. And uh, Jim, let's see. I lost my spot. Here he is. Uh, love the show. Let's me look like I know what I'm doing at work as an IT support manager. You both glad managed to, to make sense of the cutting edge tech. So, yes, glad to help indeed. I'm writing because I have a dilemma. I'm in charge of updating our company's existing media center facility to have an HD workflow, at least to try to improve the overall view quality, which is currently subpar. We produce a biweekly hour-long training seminar for others, and right now... Uh, we are using SD, Sony, Pan, Tilt, and Zoom lower-end cameras. 
I've been much impressed with the quality that Twit has with its Canon Vixia cameras and will be moving to them next year. Anyway, the problem is getting the video into the computer so that I can stream it out. From the switcher, I can go HDMI, HD, SDI, SDR, SD. I'd like to go HDMI, so I'm going to go to Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle. Uh, but Blackmagic cards have very persnickety, I like that word, USB 3.0 requirements. They need the 3.0 super speed ports and an X58 motherboard. They recommend an HP Z400 server. That seems a bit old. Um, I really don't like building out a system for this. So I'd like to know if there are any pre-made X58 USB 3.0 systems from major manufacturer that can accept it without tweaking. Uh, so the Intensity uh, Shuttle is a USB 3.0 external device. It has HDMI inputs. Com I think it has component inputs, composite inputs, those types of things. It's a video capture system as well as it has outputs too. Um, and we actually use one here. Actually, this, our secondary camera right here, uh, this one is running through a shuttle into uh, our streaming computer right now. So, um, and that is not running an X58 platform, I think. Actually, it might be. But, okay, so here, here's the key. They are very particular about it. Um, I think a lot of the problems have been resolved with newer chips. The problem was, mm -hmm. remember when USB 3.0 came out, a lot of controllers were attached to less, um, I guess I'll say, less bandwidth capable components, right? They, they didn't have enough bandwidth to really fully utilize USB 3.0. With that out of the way, things are much more relieved. One of the things you can do is you can find the ASUS U3 S6 add-in card, which is a PCI Express x4 add-in card. It gives you two USB 3.0 ports and two SATA 6G ports. And you can install that in any computer, and that has provided us with the capability to use the, uh, the specific, the Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle device on any PC when you use that add-in card. Um, otherwise, you know, they recommend the NEC controller for USB 3.0, and that's easily the most popular USB 3.0 controller right now. So, um, you know, if you go look, uh, one of the things you have to do is you want a pre-made system, find out exactly what motherboard they're using. So if you go to a, a CyberPower, an Origin, a Main Gear, they will tell you the exact motherboard that they're going to use when you build your system. And you can go to that manufacturer's site and see what controller they're using for their USB 3.0. If it's NEC, you should be good to go. Uh, if it's AS Media, you should be good to go on that as well. Um, because that's kind of based on that same technology. And then, like I said, if you want to, you have the capability to buy the external USB 3.0 add-in card, and you'd be good to go that way, too. So, there you have it. Gabriel has a question about three-way SLI with the two-win cards. He says, I heard your story about the EVGA GTX 560 Ti two-win, and I was wondering, could I pair it with an EVGA GTX 560 Ti I just built into my new PC for three-way SLI? Also, if I could, what size power supply unit would I need? You know, off the top of my head, I would say no and a big-ass one. <laughs> <laughs> Because at that point, you're pushing, you would be pushing 300 watts, 300, 400 watts for your cards at that point? Probably, or am I probably doing the math wrong. You're probably doing 400, maybe a little yeah. bit over that for the graphics cards. But, That's I mean, a lot of power for GPUs. Yeah, it's a lot of power for <laughs> GPUs. Also, uh, for whatever reason, I never, I've never understood this. The G, the EVGA GTX 460 mm -hmm. Ti two win and the 560 Ti two win, both have an SLI connection on them. They are both disabled. You cannot pair your 560 Ti2 win with uh, a separate 560 Ti or another 560 Ti2 win or anything, really, for that matter. Um, when I ask them why they have that on there, still, they don't really. They say it could be enabled at a later date, and they never enable it. So <laughs> if you buy a GTX 560 Ti2 win, expect that to be your only video card at that point, um, which isn't a bad thing. It's still a great card, but it's not... Uh, it is not currently expandable, and I wouldn't count on it. And a lot of times I might say, yeah, they'll probably do that in the future. This time I'm, I right. do not believe they because they never did it for the 460 version of that card. <laughs> there you have it. Interesting have, question. Uh, Oops, go ahead. I was going to say, would you uh, Chase or, or Andrew? Um, about the yeah, let's, let's, let's do Chase there. Okay. 
Got an interesting email from Chase about the Battlefield 3 bottleneck. Thanks, guys. Now we're on a tight schedule, so I will try to keep this brief. I have the following setup, and I cannot seem to get a steady frame rate over 45 to 50 frames per second in Ultra on BF3. It's got ABMD FX8120 running at 4.5 gigahertz, uh, MSI HD6990, MSI HD6970, and TriFire with an MSI 89 FX GD65. Uh, I'm assuming that's a motherboard patch the latest BIOS. 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance running at 1600 megahertz. Intermax 1350 watt PSU. Corsair 870 3X Crucial SSDs. Uh, 128 gigabytes running in RAID 0. And an iFinity 5760 by 1080 resolution. Three 24 inch monitors. One, I want to compliment. I want you to compliment Chase about being very specific and listing everything in his system. Uh, and then he says, am I doing something wrong? The system is stable. It's just not performing like I would expect. I know guys with 16970 getting the same frame rates. Is the CPU that bad? And I'm kind of wondering if it's trying to run across three monitors that is the issue. <laughs> um, I first wanted to say... Uh I liked when you just said you wanted to compliment that person for being yeah. so incredibly detailed because it, it, my my audio feed cut out and it looked like it was a like you cursed and, and Chad just was able to, to hit the <laughs> the bleep button there. Um, so so he's doing fifty seven sixty by ten eighty. I mean, he's so, run the you know the AMD FX eighty one twenty. It's a three gigahertz eight core processor. So here here's what here's here's kind of a disappointing answer. Right. If uh, let me let me find this story over at um, uh, Hardo CP did a really good story on okay. multi GPU scaling on Bulldozer, and uh, I'm gonna see if I can find it real quick. Uh, no, of course I can't. Um, but the the fact is, for single GPU performance, Bulldozer processor was really doing just fine. Um, for okay. multi GPU scaling, it was much less impressive. Um, so here, let me. I think I found it here. Oh, uh, talking about clock per thread. Well, he, they do specifically look at multi GPU gaming performance. Um, I will put it also into the show notes here, right at this uh, at at this question, and um, you'll see that it things just don't scale as well with bulldozer than they do with with sandy bridge um let's see where are we at here there's a lot of variability in it is what it comes down to so yeah if you look at like dragon age 2 um three-way sli doesn't scale very well on the fx like it's a difference of 46 frames per second versus 67 frames per second that's Ooh. a pretty big difference now these are using nvidia gpus so it's kind of it's hard to say um right. exactly what the difference is there I still think, I think your frame rate and that hardware is probably pretty accurate. He says he's seeing people getting higher frame rates with a single GPU. Are they also running three monitors, though? He doesn't yeah, really specify that. That was the one thing, because I can't believe anybody's running a single 6970 across a 5760 by 1080 tri-head resolution and, and getting higher frame rates. Um, is it worth it to dump the motherboard and the CPU and, and going with a, a, a late model Sandy Bridge as a replacement? Um, to be perfectly honest with you, so this this guy, Chase, is not afraid of spending money. Uh, <laughs> based on the fact that he has a 6990, 6970, right. three SSDs, three monitors. Um, you know, you can get the Core i7 2600K. This might this might even be a perfect place for you as, as the uh, forward-looking user to look at the Sandy Bridge E. Now that there you're talking about a five hundred and something dollar processor and a you know two hundred dollar motherboard. If you go Sandy Bridge, you can get like a hundred and eighty to hundred and fifty dollar motherboard and a three hundred dollar processor. So you can save a little money that way. Um, I don't think I would do that yet. If 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 money is not an issue, then sure you can right. There's, you'll, you'll be able to improve your performance that way. <laughs> if money, if you're like, I spent all this money, I don't really want to invest anymore yet. I think you'll be okay waiting a little bit. And, and that, those, that graphic hardware will still be very powerful in six months if you want to upgrade the processor then. Um, I'm trying to see. No. Yeah, there's, it doesn't say what settings he's running the game at. So Battlefield 3 is obviously the most 
graphically intense game out there now. And 57 by 5760 by 1080 is a lot of pixels to push. So if he's running it at right. ultra, maybe try running it at high. Uh, disable uh, deferred rent or deferred um, anti-aliasing. Um, you know, because some of those things you're talking about that that can make a pretty big difference. If Chase, if you want to write back in. To, to, to our email address, even if we don't talk about it on here, you know, if you tell me what settings you're using, I can tell you how that kind of compares the results that I may have seen with that type of setup as well. But, uh, yeah, nice rig either way. Yeah. I color me jealous. Uh, there was an one? interesting... Oh, yeah. Uh, do you want to do... We've talked about hard drives already, haven't we? Maybe we should um, do something else. How about the Windows Experience Index? <laughs> Andrew yeah, wants to know like about this. this. He says, with Windows Vista and Windows 7, I've not checked if it's in developer preview of Windows 8, what is the value of the Windows Experience Index? I, can, uh, I can't imagine it being very granular for benchmarking, if it can even be called that, but is it better to use, uh, say, X is better than Y? So basically, what, what value is the Windows Experience Index? So this is a really funny... I admit, at some point, Microsoft decides that they 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 need a tool inside of Windows to be able to, so they can point and say it's your hardware's fault. It's not Windows' fault. It's your hardware. Um, and the Windows Experience Index is really weird in that it runs a bunch of benchmarks. It is it is at its core a benchmarking tool. Not all benchmarking tools are great ways of comparing hardware, but it, what it does is it goes, you have this and it runs this and this and this and this and this, and then it generates a number. And what's really misleading about the Windows Experience Index is that it generates the number based on, it, it picks the slowest, it basically runs a series of tests, your, your, dry, your, your graphics, your drives, your CPUs, um, and then it picks the lowest of those numbers and it gives you a score. <laughs> and it's really funny because if you don't have a fat 3D card, it can give you a really crappy Windows Experience Index number. And the reality is if you don't do a lot of 3D gaming, you don't care. Um, so it's, 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 I know some system manufacturers that have found the Windows Experience Index incredibly frustrating because people make valid choices on their hardware, but their Windows Experience Index number isn't as high as they want it to be. You know, if you move to a faster CPU, if you move to a faster hard drive, if you move to a faster graphics card, yes, your Windows Experience Index will go up. Um, you know, but like all synthetic benchmarks, all synthetic benchmarks are a great comparison of hardware performance on a synthetic benchmark. So, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, will it give you an overall indicator of where your system is lagging? Possibly. Um, if you have something to compare it to, but back, you know, benchmarks don't work well in a vacuum and benchmarks don't work well. If you're looking for a specific thing to improve, I want, you know, everything to run faster. I want Photoshop to run faster. I want this video game to run faster. Um, some video games are best improved by CPU upgrades. Some video games are best improved by GPU upgrades. And your system, based on its age and the components you chose when you built it, may require both CPU and GPU upgrades to improve your experience. So, uh, you know, yes, it can be used to say X is better than Y, um, but it is not the tool I would use to choose hardware. So uh, is, is that it's, too much information or too little? No, no. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's basically Windows trying to figure out a way that it could not reliably, not uh, effectively, but easily compare systems to one another. And, 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 and the whole fact of using that lowest score really does annoy me as well. Uh, if you look at the individual scores, you can get a little bit of information out of it. You can tell how your storage performance compares to your notebook storage performance or something like that. It, I mean, it's interesting to look at, but there's a reason why we never use this in our reviews, right? But I was, right. I was lo interesting. I was looking at the Wikipedia entry on this and there was an instance uh recently where does it say this um where sandforce announced that their latest ssd processors enabled a single ssd to reach a perfect 7.9 for the hard drive subscore test supporting the idea that manufacturers may at least identify when their products do very well in the windows <laughs> experience score right so that's, that's the fact the that there's a perfect score right so 7.9 <laughs> is the highest it goes with uh, Windows 7, 5.9 was the highest it went with Windows 
Vista. These are completely arbitrary numbers. They're just, you know, right. kind of laid out there that way. But it's, it's, I mean, it's funny. It's yeah, I mean, the current version of WinSat and Windows, oh, this is Windows Vista and Windows 7 build 76.13.385 performs arrow assessment, direct 3D alpha blending, direct 3D texture load, direct 3D ALU assessment, Windows media playback, CPU performance, memory performance, disk performance. Um, you know, it's a benchmark. Um, yep. You know, it, there's some interesting stuff you could read, like the Windows 7 WI score 6.0 through 7.9 explained, um, <laughs> which is up on the Softpedia. Um, you know, because it's kind of funny. It's, it's it's you know you laugh, but there's when you when you do benchmarking, one of the things you do is you cannot compare previous versions of a benchmark versus new versions of a benchmark. If you've been, you know, running the benchmarks for several years, you may be able to sort of instinctively know after a little while running the new benchmark that if it got that score on the old benchmark, it'll probably get this score on the new benchmark. Um, but it's so funny. It's just, you know, <laughs> scores 6.0 through 7.9 were made available by Microsoft as a move designed to keep the operating system's WI metrics up to the evolution of the hardware, uh, says Softpedia. Uh, six and seven were added to recognize the improved experiences one might have with newer hardware, especially SSDs, graphics adapters, and multi-core processors. Um, you know, with respect to SSDs, the focus of the newer test is on random I.O. rates and their avoidance of the long latency issues, uh, the software giant explained. Um, it's it's just really funny. They don't identify whether it's an SSD, but they, they, they you know, they specifically note things that SSDs are much better. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, so the Windows Experience Index, I wonder when they're going to update it again. Um, Windows 8, know. man. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe before then, if they get bored. Um, you know, to, obtain, <laughs> you know, to obtain scores in the 6 or 7 range, a GPU must obtain very good performance scores. The adapter must support DX10, and the driver must be at least a WDDM 1.1 driver. For WDDM 1.0 drivers, only DX9 assessments will be run. Therefore, the overall score will be capped at 5.9. I mean, this is, and this is like, this is classic. Like, this is. Artificial benchmarks are awesome, but you're basically benchmarking something that doesn't exist, i.e. the benchmark. You know, it's, you know, is there value to it? Yes. You know, uh, the problem is, is, is you can, you can have, a, you can have an application to be like, you know, geez, my widget is running really slowly. I should look at the Windows Experience Index and the Windows Experience Index is a 4.3. And so I'm going to upgrade the thing that's a 4.3 because that's the low number in my score. Therefore, it must be the thing throwing my machine down you know and and you upgrade your gpu and it's like okay now my now widget my application isn't running any faster because it's constrained by io from the drive system but you don't know that unless you explore and learn what makes particular software run faster or slower on 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 computers so you know overall yeah i, I think it's an incredible it's just, it was just a weird thing for microsoft to introduce um and i don't think it's particularly useful uh, other than maybe if you want to know that your new hardware is faster than your old hardware <laughs> in a very vague and not particularly useful way. <laughs> is that going to wrap so, up the show this week? Yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've been snarky enough against Microsoft. What's coming up <laughs> on PC Per this week now that you've got me thinking about buying a freaking $280 GPU? Boy, I'm going to be real popular around my house. Look, so we got we got the kit in for our uh, mineral oil PC. We're going to start opening yes. with opening that, and uh, I'm not going to promise we're going to have any oil in a system yet. We're going to start playing with it and choosing which hardware we're going to use, and we're going to make like a multiple video segment type thing out of it. Uh, we have a load of X79 motherboards for those interested in Sandy Bridge. Oh, and also um, the Sandy Bridge E. 3930K, the other processor, the not $1,000 processor, the $500 processor. I finally got one of those in and was able to run, nice. run it through some tests. So I think, I think our benchmarks will show that this is easily the better choice for <laughs> people that aren't uh, millionaires, many, many thousandaires or something like that. So, uh, That's thousandaires. <laughs> yes. Check that out. All in preparation for CES next month. I'm so excited. Do I look excited? You look almost excited about CES as I do. Of course, uh, Techzilla and PCPer will be covering CES in force. PCPer's coverage will be available at pcper.com slash CES, I assume. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, that's that's accurate. Yes, sir. 
The up-to-the-minute coverage from Techzilla and the rest of the Revision 3 technology crew will be available at revision3.com slash CES. And, of course, our beloved friends at Twitch will be covering CES. Uh, uh, I should say Twitch, actually. <laughs> Twitch will be there in full force doing live coverage from the show floor pretty much 24-7, as near as I can tell. <laughs> uh, in the more immediate future over at Techzilla... Uh, we're going to be doing, uh, I'm going to show you how to basically spoof uh, your IP address. You can pretend you're browsing from any country, which is especially useful if you are, say, a BBC fan or a curling fan from up in Canada. We got a Google TV 2.0 uh, uh, demo coming up. We're going to explain why Apple forces you to use Wi Fi instead of 3G, even when <laughs> Wi Fi is actually slower than 3G. And we got an interview with Kevin Mitnick coming up. Uh, Kevin Mitnick sent a new book coming around. Yep. And he's going to be talking to us about how to avoid getting uh, yourself social engineered. And then uh, I've also got to fix the check engine light. Uh, I got the new version of the AutoTap hardware I picked up. And I'm going to be talking about that incredibly cool software for trying to figure out what has gone horribly wrong with your car. Or maybe just why that stupid check engine light is up on the dashboard. OBD2 is fun when you can make it do what you want it to. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. So that's it for this edition of This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Dorn. I'm Ryan Schrupp. We'll see you next week on Twitch.